Good morning and welcome to this time of worship with the Christian Reformed Church of Prince George. We're glad that you could join in this time. It's a special Sunday today. Every Sunday is fairly special, but today is a special day in the Christian calendar, the Christian worship calendar, in that it is Palm Sunday. It's a day that we remember that the Sunday before Easter, Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. The people wave palm branches and lay down their coats before him and, and worship him and, they, they, and celebrate him and anticipate the salvation that he brings to the people. But as they discover later in the week that this salvation is different than they thought it might be, that it's a salvation that fulfills a prophetic agenda from the Old Testament, not a political agenda against a Roman Empire. And so as we enter into Palm Sunday worship, we remember that we need to worship God for who he truly is and for the way that he works, and not as a God who's simply there to serve our agendas or add a, some kind of morality uh, to our lives but we worship God as he truly is, the God who comes to save us because we are people who need saving. And so we enter into this time of worship, embracing Christ as king and offering ourselves to him as citizens of his kingdom. Let's join together in this prayer as our call to worship. Please join in, pray along with the bolded lines. Loving Father, as we journey with your Son in this week of remembrance and hope, help us to understand you and your love for the world more clearly. Transform us by the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and prepare us for service in your kingdom. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. People of God, receive the greeting of our living God this morning. Grace and peace to you from Christ our King, who with the Father and Spirit is one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us worship God. And we're going to sing some songs now. And one of the things that we could perhaps do is rather than just sitting down and watching this like a TV show, we need to remember that this is a worship service that we participate in. So I'd encourage you, if you're able, uh, and if it's still easy to read the words on the screen, to stand up and join in our singing. Let us worship God together.
sang hosanna all glory laud and honor we praise christ we praise god just like the people did as he entered jerusalem all those years ago but like the people who greeted jesus as he entered jerusalem and then five days later were yelling crucify him we ourselves are somewhat fickle people who often deny christ in our thoughts words and in our deeds and so now remembering the events of jesus last week helps us see ourselves for what we are sinners in need of a savior but a savior who <laughs> thanks be to god that we have in christ and so in honesty and in hope for the triumph that he will have for us over our sins we can now come to god in a prayer of confession confessing our sins before him. Let's join in this prayer. Loving God, you rode a donkey and came in peace, humbled yourself and gave yourself for us. We confess our lack of humility. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. As you entered Jerusalem, the crowds shouted, Hosanna, save us now. On Good Friday, they shouted, Crucify. We confess that our praise is often empty. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. As the crowd laid their palms in front of you, you took no glory for yourself. We confess that we want to be accepted and take the easy way, we do not stay true to your will. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Let's each take a moment of silent prayer before God. And we pray together, forgive us, Lord, and help us to follow in the way of obedience. Amen. The people of God hear the good news that we have through Christ our King. In John 3, verse 17, we read that for God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And then Paul writes in Romans 8, that therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. The good news is that while we are more sinful than we would like to admit, we are also more loved and forgiven than we know and most certainly than we deserve. And the good news is that it's true. <laughs> it's true whether you believe it or not. But if you believe it, it's yours. And thanks be to God, and may we all join again in saying Hosanna to the Son of David, 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Good morning. Happy Palm Sunday. First, we're going to talk about a few things that I'm going to guess that you already know about Palm Sunday. First, that the people probably, you probably knew that they waved palm branches. Maybe something like this, maybe something like this. And the second, that Jesus, I'm not sure if you can see this, came riding in on a donkey. And the third thing, that the people shouted something, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. But did you know why a palm branch like this? Or like the round one, maybe. A palm branch means victory, triumph. It's a celebration symbol. Do you know why a donkey? A very important person, like Jesus, normally I would think is on a horse. Like a king, they would have a horse, a beautiful horse with tassels and maybe a special saddle. And here we have the most important person ever on a donkey. Huh. There's a reason. A donkey is an animal of peace. A horse is an animal of war. Jesus never went to war. That was never his intention. And then the third thing, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. That's kind of the same as the palm branch. It's a celebration word. This was a celebration day. Everyone is happy and cheerful and celebrating and so excited that Jesus has come to Jerusalem. There's one person that's hurting a lot. And he still allows everyone, everyone, to have this party. Do you know who that is? It's Jesus. Jesus knew that in a few short days, all of this would change. All these happy people would now use this and this to hurt him. At first, they're having a party like they love Jesus and would do anything for him. And a few days later, everything changes. They want nothing to do with Jesus. And Jesus' love is so strong, he lets them have their party. He doesn't stop them. Do you know what else? If it was happening in Prince George today, Jesus would do the same. He loves us that much that he would do the same for you and he would do the same for me. So when you read the story of Palm Sunday, remember, it was the beginning of the last few days of Jesus' life on earth. He knew everything that was going to happen. And he did it anyway. Only his love is so strong that it can erase all the mistakes we make and only Jesus knows completely and wholly all about what's in your heart. And he loves you anyway. Have a wonderful, happy Palm Sunday. Let's join together now in a time of congregational prayer. I'd like to lead us in a time of prayer for our community and the things that weigh on our hearts. And I, I invite you throughout this prayer as I end each section saying, Lord, in your mercy, you can respond by saying, hear our prayer. Let's come to God in prayer together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we thank you. We thank you that this is the day that you have made. And so we rejoice. We are glad in it. We gladly offer our praises to you. 
And we pray that even as the, the weeks and months wear on where we have been gathering each in our own home, that we can still come to this time of worship gladly, that we can offer our praises, that we can remember that this is more about you than it is about us. And Lord, we give thanks for the news we had this week that in BC we can begin uh, reopening for worship services to a limited capacity. And Lord, we pray that our church and all churches and all religious groups can steward this well and that it will not have any setbacks and that at the end of this uh, next five or six week trial or transition that we will be able to invite more people and not less. So Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. King Jesus, we pray for your rule and reign to permeate, to permeate our lives, to permeate our relationships, to permeate our workplaces and our institutions and our governments. Lord, come into this world again, both with power and authority uh, and lowliness. And come into each of these places through each one of us, your church. May we be kingdom people who take the shape and form of our king, who comes holy, uh, yet with gentleness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we give thanks for the way that there is an increased vaccine distribution and that people we know and in our community are getting appointments quickly. And so we give you thanks for that. We pray that the rollout and administration of these vaccines can happen safely and swiftly uh, and that they have an ongoing effect, Lord. And so for the work of all the healthcare system that is trying to, um, to reopen things for all of us, and especially the youth and the children, we pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, for all of the people in our church who are tired, who are weary, who are just waiting for things to change, Lord, we pray that they can have renewed joy, that a spring can come quickly, that we can have new experiences being outdoors and opportunities to gather with others. Lord, rekindle some old friendships that may have been dormant in the last little while. Uh, help us to be able to reach out to those who are lonely and weary and so, Lord, for all those who are feeling the effects of weeks and months in this latest series of, of meeting restrictions, we pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As a church, Lord, we pray that this is not a season where things are going backwards, and, um, but that this is a season where we are preparing for an even greater harvest. That just like a winter season, it's not as if there's nothing happening, but there's deep work of recovery happening beneath the surface. So Lord, for those of us who have perhaps been weary and tired and burnt out from leading certain ministries or Sunday school or, um, or different small groups and things like that, uh, Lord, we pray that this can be a season of deep renewal and that it is even building a desire in others to be able to participate in some of these, these ministries again. And so, Lord, for your church, we pray that you increase our joy, increase our fellowship in this time in different ways, deepen our worship and our prayers, surprise us in Scripture and with our own devotional Scripture readings, and surprise us with deep insight and keep sending us with urgency to the lost. For your church, Lord, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And as we enter into Holy Week once again, gather us close to you in these days when again we make that journey in meditation and recollection. Help us to contemplate again the way taken by our Savior, 
the false charges against him, the fear and flight of the disciples, the kiss of betrayal, the crown of thorns, the purple robe. And in such contemplation on these things give us courage to face those times in our own lives when he received the same at our hands. It help us also remember that you have gone before us, so we look to you for compassion and forgiveness, knowing you are able to save. When we are weak, make us strong. When hurt and resentful, make us forgiving. When defeated and discouraged, make us hopeful. Keep us from asking for mercy without giving it ourselves. Keep us from praying for your kingdom but never working for it. So in this week, deepen our faith by your matchless grace. Deepen the measure of our gratitude and Christian obedience. Move us, who have so much, to share with others who have so little. Uphold us when we summon our courage to speak out for the alien and stranger within our gates and for those long denied dignity and freedom. Guard and guide us through these days of meditation and remembrance. Guard and guide us through all our days until we come at last to that day when all our days and journeys will be gathered into your eternity and we shall be with you forever. Glory be to you, O God. Amen. Our scripture readings for this morning are both from Matthew, starting with Matthew 21, 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And then from Matthew 5, 13 and 16, to 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The events of these two stories take place approximately three years apart. One of the stories, the triumphal entry, happens in the final weeks a final couple months of Jesus on earth ministry, right before Good Friday and Easter Sunday. The other event, his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, happens in the first few weeks or months of his on earth ministry. Uh, So they bookend Jesus' ministry life. Uh, But they have so much in common, and each story actually helps us to understand the other in a way. Uh, Each of these stories reveals something. The triumphal entry reveals to us the character and nature of Christ as king and his teachings and metaphors on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 reveal to us something about the nature and character of his kingdom people, the fellowship of disciples, his church. 
King and kingdom are revealed in these two texts, and they mirror one another, as they should. The kingdom should reflect the king. The king, in all of his goodness and authority, should shape the direction and character of his kingdom. So we'll use one to help understand the other, beginning with the triumphal entry. And in the triumphal entry, we have at least three things, and I'll focus on three things that this story reveals to us about the character and nature of Christ as king. The first is that Jesus as king is different. He's distinct. The, the more biblical word would be that he's holy and set apart. You know, in a way, there's not a whole lot distinct about someone coming into a city, parading in, and people celebrating this person for their triumph, for the thing, something that they've conquered. It would happen that a military leader would come in with his whole regime on horses, and there'd be trumpets and a parade. People would wave palm branches for victory. They might lay down their coats, uh, and they'd celebrate. But this is kind of ironically called Jesus' triumphal entry. Because think about it. What has he conquered? What has he triumphed over so far? This is different because Jesus' triumph is still yet to come. Jesus is different and distinct. Even the way the whole event comes about is different and distinct and very holy because it's supernatural. How Jesus sends disciples in advance to prepare a place and, pro and procure the donkey just by saying the Lord needs it. And everything happens as he describes it would. Going into the rest of the week, events would happen as he described they would. His death and his resurrection. This is different. Jesus is distinct. Jesus is holy and set apart. And so we not only can say that there is no other king like him, but Jesus is God, and there is no other God like him. Another thing that's revealed about the nature and character of Jesus as king is his goodness, his accessibility. Yes, he is holy, but he is also humble. We see this uh, pictured... <laughs> Uh, and also just lived out as he comes on a donkey. A donkey, as Wilma described in the children's message, is not the war animal. It's not what people go into battle with, at least uh, not if you're planning on winning. Uh, but a donkey is an animal that is meant for carrying burdens, carrying loads that otherwise would be placed on ordinary human beings. That's Jesus as king. He's a servant king. And in the events that would take place later in the week, he is the one who not only just carries our burdens, but totally assumes those burdens as his own burden, all of our sin, and takes it to the cross so that we can live without our burdens, without sin and shame and guilt hanging over us. And so just as God shows, God as, as Jesus here shows that he is holy, set apart and distinct, he also shows us that he is humble. He is not here to intimidate and drive people away or as a war horse to go in a pace, uh, in a place where people can't follow him, but he's there to take people alongside him, for people to be able to see and reach out to him, for them to know him. It shows how relational he is, too. And the third thing that's revealed about Jesus as king here is how he came to fulfill prophecy. Uh, people celebrated him, but they celebrated him for the wrong reasons. They thought he was here to fulfill a political agenda, a military agenda, to drive out the Romans, to make Jerusalem great again. But Jesus did not come to fulfill a political agenda, but a prophetic agenda. To be the king 
that Israel was meant to have from the line of David. A king who is not just of the line of David, but who is God. He came to fulfill all prophecy for being the, the world's Messiah, Israel's Messiah, and through them, and now through the church, the world's Messiah. We see this as Matthew draws attention to those, those texts in Zechariah 9 and Psalm 118. The people say that and think of him as a prophet, but Matthew wants us to see and to know and embrace Jesus not merely as a prophet, but as someone who fulfills all prophecy. So Jesus as holy, Jesus as humble, and Jesus as fulfilling all Old Testament prophecy means that he is the king that we need and that God knows we need, that God says we need. He's not the king that we want, who's going to just fulfill our desires and come alongside and and speak and, and work into our agendas. But God as king is the one who reorients and reforms all of our desires and all of our agendas. So each Palm Sunday is a Sunday to reflect as a church whether we worship God as we want him to be and we think about God as we'd like him to be or if we are worshiping God and living for God as he wants us to be. That we submit ourselves to him as citizens of his kingdom. There are two dangers that often happen for pretty much everyone, uh, especially in the Western culture, and we see this in Canada, both for Christians and non-Christians. One big er error that we can fall into, as Christians especially, is that we want Jesus as king, but we don't necessarily want the kingdom. We want God as king, we want that gospel that's maybe we read about more in, in Paul's letters of justification by faith. We're saved from our sins, but then we don't follow the king into his kingdom, living for reconciliation, reconciliation being agents of renewal uh, in all spheres of life, celebrating and using the gifts of the Holy Spirit, working for justice, for peace, embodying the multi-ethnic diversity that the gospel just leads to and even demands. The error that a lot of Christians fall into is that we want the king, but we don't go into the kingdom or live for the kingdom. And the error that I think we see in a lot of secular culture, especially in Canada, is that people want the kingdom or something that looks like the kingdom of God, but we don't want God. We want the kingdom, but we don't want the king. Uh, we want justice. We want reconciliation. We want shalom. Uh, we want equality. We want diversity. <laughs> but we don't have anything like the gospel. We don't have anything like the kingdom of God that can actually give a foundation for all of those things to be needed or even accomplished. And there's a lot of philosophers and some historians and sociologists that have pointed out, both, both Christian and non-Christian writers in the last little while, that have been able to show that, uh, that without the Judeo-Christian worldview, uh, you don't actually have a basis for human rights or morality these days. We want the kingdom, but if we don't have the king, that central orienting person in reality, it's just not going to happen. And that's why we have all these competing uh, ideologies and political agendas these days that people really don't want to compromise on. So as Christians, the error we fall into is wanting the king without the kingdom. A lot of non-Christians fall into the era Er error of wanting the kingdom without the king. But you cannot separate king and kingdom. What God has joined together, let no one celebrate. But now as we turn our attention to Matthew 5 and Jesus' teachings in the Sermon on the Mount, we see that all along, even before Easter, 
even before Pentecost, that it was Christ's intention that his kingdom people and the character of his kingdom people would mirror the character that he has as king. And we see this in the three metaphors that he uses in Matthew 5, verse 13 to 16. Salt, light, and city. A little bit on each one of those. The church as salt highlights our distinctiveness, our difference, our holiness. Salt is used for many different functions. It's often used for seasoning. Uh, It's used to bring out flavor. We bring out the flavor of the kingdom of God in the world. Salt can be used in wounds. Yes, it it stings, but it, it is a medicine of sort. It purifies. But the most, the most common use of salt, and probably what Jesus is alluding to most with salt in this metaphor, it is its negative function, in that salt is a preservative. It prevents rot. See, the world, left to its own devices and its own desires, as Paul talks about in Romans 1, will just naturally lead to rot and decay and things just imploding on itself and people imploding on themselves and one another. But the church as salt is this preservative. It brings out the flavor of the kingdom of God. It helps things hold together and to find their renewal in Christ, to find their good intention and purpose as it comes from how God created it to be. But salt is only useful as it, as it has two certain applications. One is as we re- remain distinct. Salt cannot lose its saltiness. Once the church loses its distinctiveness, we no longer actually become of service to our world. There's always the balance of whether we are, should be more relevant or not. But really, we can only be relevant to the world and, and as much as we <laughs> remain being somewhat irrelevant or at least very distinct. Uh, the pastor theologian John Stott says that the influence of Christians in and on society depends on their being distinct, not being identical. The second way that salt can be useful to our society is that we do have to permeate. Yes, we have to be distinct, but we can't just stay separate. We have to permeate. God sends his kingdom people into workplaces, into neighborhoods, into all areas of culture and life so that we can bring out the flavor of the kingdom of God rather than letting the world and our culture just implode on itself. The church is like our king. The kingdom people are like the king in our distinctiveness, in our holiness. We are salt. We also see how the kingdom people of the church are like our king in the metaphor of light. Light is revealing. <laughs> Light is, is the metaphor for truth. We are truth people. We point to God as truth. And, and another property of light is that it illuminates the darkness. As Christians are light in the world, we can point out where people stumble, uh, where people are going to just get caught in sin, uh, to be able to point to the better way, the way of Christ. That Jesus is the light of the world. He is truth, and he, he's the one who leads us in the truth and in the, the way of truth to the Father. He illuminates the darkness. The darkness cannot overcome him, as John, 1 verse, or John chapter 1 says. And so the church as light is a testimony to, to the way, the truth, and the life. Now, this is not just ministry of deeds and just arguing and trying to articulate the truth of the gospel, but in his metaphor of light, Jesus says that our good deeds shine before people, uh, and it leads people to praise God our Father. So word and deed are held together here. Just like how Jesus were attracted, people were attracted to Jesus and followed him, not just for the things that he said, but for the deeds that he did for healing, for his miracles, for his self-giving love on the cross. 
And once again, in this metaphor, we see how kingdom people mirror our king. Because just as we are to do good deeds to the praise of God our Father in heaven, Jesus was always and only for giving praise to his Father in heaven. It's all throughout the Gospels of how he's living for the glory of God and submits himself to the will of God, even to death on a cross. Therefore, it should not surprise him that just surprise us that just as people praised Christ and then later would be the same people who yell crucify him, that as a church is committed to the way of Christ and the truth of the gospel, that we will both be celebrated and ridiculed. Jesus says this in that last beatitude right before he talks about us as salt and light, where he says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and say all kinds of false things about you because of me, because of the light. Once again, John Stott, as he says, he has this great line where he says that the more and more that we as Christians are actually living as the light of Christ, the more likely people will come up to Christians and say, Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. And as we're committed to the light, uh, we will be able to enlighten people of where our goodness and where our love and our selflessness comes from. Salt, light, the third metaphor that Jesus mixes in here is that of city. That if Jesus is the one who fulfills a prophetic agenda, then his kingdom people are people who fulfill a kingdom agenda. A kingdom agenda that has us looking and acting like a new city. Kingdom people are a communal people. You can't have Christianity without the Christian community. Tim Keller, as he talks about this metaphor of city and church, talks about how distinct it is from, uh, from clubs. We, lo- we like to talk about a lot of different communities out there, but these, they're usually clubs, like a knitting club or a sports club or some kind of even political club. And, and it highlights, and, and these are clubs because it really means we have one thing in common or maybe a couple things in common with these other people in those clubs. But a church as a community, as a city, means that we have all things in common. A city is an integrated life that includes our public lives, our private lives, our economics, uh, our our social justice issues, our environmental care, uh, all of our policies, uh, all of our fellowship, all of our gatherings. It's all like a new city. And so the thing that I would encourage you to reflect on today and through this week is that as a community, does our church function more like a club? Or how does our church maybe function more like a city? And for each of us personally, does your participation in the life of PGCRC look more like you're joining a club or that you've become a citizen of a new city, a distinct and good city, salt and light. And if we can maintain this commitment to being kingdom people and mirroring our kingdom life after that of our king, our king who comes as salt to preserve us for eternity, our king who comes as light to guide us in the way of truth, then just as he comes to be the king that we need, not just the king that we want, then as we are committed to him as our king, then we can be the kind of city, the kind of new city that our city needs. It's not hard to be a church that our city wants us to be, but we are to be salt and light, a city that our city needs. And as John Stott sums all of this up, he says that salt and light and city speak to the kind of influence a community of disciples can have if we live by the Beatitudes. This is the way in which we are blessed. 
It is the way the world will be best be served. It is the way that God will be glorified. Amen. Let's join in prayer. God, you are our king. And you are a king who came to be a crucified king, a crucified and risen saving king. And as your kingdom people, may we go into this city and into all of our different workplaces and vocations taking the same shape and the same form that you did to be a cruciform people, a suffering people, but a life-giving people. Help us with courage and conviction and great joy to pick up our cross and follow you. Amen. Thanks again for joining in this time of worship. We're glad that you could be a part of this time and set some time aside. And our prayer is that you go into this week as kingdom people, keeping the king before you and reading the Bible in ways where you see God as king and you read the gospels there where you see Christ as king and be asking yourself, what kind of kingdom life is he inviting me into? Because I want to be in. We pray that that's the way you encounter God and are led by the Spirit into this week. 
Before we wrap up today in this time of worship, I'd li also like to extend an invitation for you to join in a time of fellowship with our PGCRC citizens, this little mini city. Uh, we have a Zoom call that launches immediately after the premiered version of this worship service, and there, that link is in the Sunday morning email that you would have gotten. And so we'll see you there in just a minute or two. But go into this week uh, with God's blessing. This is from Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, remain with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace.